Welcome, everybody, and welcome to Kubernetes MLSEC, Securing AI in Space. Uh, James and I will introduce ourselves uh, momentarily. For now, we would like to thank very much CNCF uh, for another spectacular uh, KubeCon this year here in Paris. Uh, Right, I'm Francesco, I'm Head of Technical Solutions for Control Plane. I started my career in uh, 2010 11 as a security engineer for the European government, deployed in London, looking at system security, network security, and data security. Then in 2015, I joined Imarsat, a satellite mobile provider. I was Chief Security Engineer for the Satellite Control Center. Then I change position, um, head of security operations engineering, so my team uh, would uh, look after the technology stack uh, enabling security operations 24-7 for the company. And then I moved as a head of security engineering, so it uh, was a bigger team. Uh, my guys would also consult the internal business units on their crazy projects. And then I didn't want to see a data center in my life again, so I joined Control Plane. Uh, we are a cloud native security consultancy, as we will explain later. And James, over to you. Good morning, everyone. My name is James Callahan. I'm a principal consultant at Control Plane. Um, I have an unusual path into tech. I started my career as a theoretical particle physicist. Uh, however, 10 years ago, I got interested in cybersecurity. I saw how much bad code was out there, especially written by physicists, uh, myself included. Um, and this uh, drove me to uh, cybersecurity. I worked for 10 years with, um, with government as a cybersecurity consultant, engineer, um, and I moved to Control Plane uh, when I was, became interested in Kubernetes and container security. Um, I am the author of um, a couple of courses for the Linux Foundation on Zero Trust. Uh, I do some training for O'Reilly, uh, but my day-to-day -day is as a consultant. Very well. So, Control Plane, real quick. We are, as I said, a cloud native security consultancy established in uh, 2017, uh, based in London, but we operate globally. Uh, really, specialists in uh, cloud security, Kubernetes, uh, in general, container security. Customer base includes uh, governments, financial services, and in general, we like to work with regulated industries for reasons that will become clear later in the talk. And we have over uh, 40, uh, 50 people uh, across the continents. As I said, everything to do with uh, Kubernetes, container, and cloud security, it's us, zero trust architectures. Um, DevOps, DevSecOps, uh, infrastructure and application delivery. Then we also fill the gap between uh, cloud infrastructure, cloud architectures, and security operations center, ensuring uh, visibility and um, response capabilities for organizations. Then we harden SDLCs, supply chains, and then we pen test all the above. Uh, just a quick shout out to our community contributions. Of course, we are uh, members of the Linux Foundation. We are part of the uh, Security Tag, or Technical uh, Advisory Group. Our um, CEO, Andy Martin, is the co-chair for it. And then also we are a uh, silver member of the CNCF. We are also silver members for the Finos, or the FinTech Open Source Foundation. And our CEO, Andy Martin, is also the pro bono CISO for Open UK. Monsieur? OK, so let's talk about um, our topic for today. Uh, so we're going to start with a general introduction to the AI ecosystem, and we're going to talk briefly about different levels and types of artificial intelligence. We'll dive into a few use cases and then focus on the topic for today's talk, uh, which will be machine learning. Um, and what we will do is focus on the machine learning lifecycle. Based on this, we will try and gain an understanding of the problem space of securing such a lifecycle. Uh, which is, as we will see, a non-trivial task. We will see lots of um, um, uh, parallels with supply chain security. We'll then get to the most interesting part of the talk, um, where we'll actually present a threat model uh, for a real-life use case in the SATCOM domain. Uh, we'll go through a threat modeling methodology uh, to navigate the MLSEC problem space and identify risks and security countermeasures to mitigate the most common issues that will arise. All right, so let's start with a very high-level introduction to the different types and levels of AI. Uh, the current and most basic level um, is what the experts call artificial narrow intelligence, or weak AI. It's de de developed and designed to carry out a finite number of tasks, such as reactively answering um, humans' questions, and can only operate on a predetermined set of data. 
Uh, so examples would be Siri, uh, Google Assistant, and the uh, infamous uh, ChatGPT, a student's best friend, of course. The intermediate level of AI would be called artificial general intelligence, or strong AI. Now, this is aspirational. Um, this is for the next decades, and at this point, is purely theoretical. Um, so fictional examples would be HAL 9000 or Data in Star Trek or Skynet in Terminator. Um, the major difference here is that this is human-like AI and more importantly um, can adapt to new situations uh, rather than operating as before on this predetermined set of data. Finally, we have truly hypothetical, academial, dreamy stuff uh, where we have artificial super intelligence. Uh, this is where um, the AI possesses superhuman capabilities and it would be characterized by continuous self-improvement. Um, more examples here would be Ultron from the Marvel Universe or Gizgard from Asimov's novels. Okay, so AI, as we can see, and as we know already probably, um, is a large domain with a number of branches. Um, here is uh, an overview, kind of a spider diagram um, of these domains, um, and we um, will show you today where we are sitting within this uh, diagram. Uh, so we're looking at machine learning. Um, so machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence that focuses on mathematical formulae and statistical models uh, that computer systems employ to carry out operations without being explicitly programmed. Instead, uh, they can use ML to take what they have learned from the present context and generalize this to new tasks that modify their programs automatically. Within the ML branch, we have three different types, and here you can see kind of a use case diagram where we have these three types and um, the, the use cases around the edge. Uh, so first of all, we have unsupervised learning. Uh, this analyzes data without predefined labels, um, identifying inherent patterns, clusters, or structures within the data. It's used for tasks like clustering or dimensionality reduction. Reinforcement learning then at the bottom of the diagram involves an agent that learns by interacting with an environment and receiving rewards or punishments for its actions. The agent's objective is then to, um, uh, to maximize cumulative rewards, um, making it suitable for things like um, game, learning game, uh, games or uh, robotic control, things like that. Supervised learning then uh, utilizes labeled data, and this is what we'll be focusing on later, uh, to train a model to make predictions or classifications based on input features. The model learns to map inputs to outputs, making it useful for tasks like regression or classification. And Francesco will go into some more detail on this later on. So let's focus then on these two use cases within the supervised learning branch. Uh, first of all, we have classification. Uh, this is the process of assigning a category to input data sample. Uh, so example uses would be predicting whether a person is ill um, or um, detecting fraudulent transactions given a transaction history, uh, face classification, things like that. Regression then um, is the process of predicting um, a continuous numerical value for an input data sample. Uh, example usages here would be assessing house prices given market conditions, uh, forecasting grocery store uh, demand, temperature forecasting, things like this. So in supervised learning, the model operates, uh, optimizes its internal parameters based on the input labels to discover patterns and relationships in the training data. These variables control the transformation and mapping of the input data to the output labels. And once trained, the model can use fresh input data to predict or categorize objects based on previously discovered patterns. On this, over to Francesco for a bit more detail. Very well. So now we have a high level understanding of AI in general. But to really appreciate what could go wrong, which is what we do at Control Plane, we threat model everything. Um, what can go wrong when you build an AI ML platform? It's important we discuss the overall life cycle associated with such platforms, from the, tra from the data being ingested through the model training uh, all the way down to producing applications for uh, downstream customers or other applications to consume uh, the trained model. So uh, to do that, we will draw an interesting parallelism uh, with something that most of you are familiar with, hopefully. Let's then talk about AI ML Ops life cycle. And to start, we'll, start uh, we'll, we'll begin with something absolutely groundbreaking, something no one has ever heard about. DevOps. 
So let's start with uh, the good old uh, DevOps loop, uh, part of the uh, SDLC. Pretty sure everyone um, is uh, pretty familiar with the DevOps concepts and the DevOps loops, which consists of a continuous uh, process uh, that integrates uh, software development and, guess what, IT ops to streamline and automating software delivery. Um, I'm not going to go through each phase, but one of the key elements of DevOps uh, is really to foster collaboration, to make sure people are on the same page, different teams work together in a cohesive manner towards an objective, which is to deploy applications fast and streamlined. Basically, yeah, um, has this human element to it, which is very important. Why? Because exactly the same principles were applied to another loop, the data ML loop. Uh, along the same lines, um, this uh, loop was introduced uh, to de define the continuous end-to-end -end pro end -end process uh, from gathering data to uh, trained ML models, uh, forcing data scientists, data engineers, uh, and ML engineers to actually work together. Um, you know, here we have the exact same loop, but defined for data ML, from DevOps to data ML, continuous process to integrate uh, data operations, we machine learning development to streamline the deployment and management of machine learning models. However, this only covers for data and model training. How do we then produce applications based on that? Well, guess what? Someone put the two loops together. They came up with this, or the Data ML DevOps lifecycle, aka the eternal knot. Um, and really, this is a, um, you know, converging the two loops uh, into this eternal knot, uh, which is a, fundamentally a paradigm to then build a reliable and scalable MLOps, AI-based systems and applications. And this really shows you the end-to-end -end from data being ingested to models being trained to applications being developed to then consume these models from um, downstream customers, as I said, other applications as well. However, here comes the issue. We spent a long time, a long, long time, and we are still spending a lot of time securing DevOps, right? Shifting left, introducing DevSecOps, all that good stuff. Um, however, what do we do for the other uh, loop, right? Now they are together, and the security of one can influence the security of the other. So what do we have to do? Effectively, the exact same thing. So we have to focus on securing that loop uh, to achieve end-to-end -end security for the eternal knot, aka introducing the concept of MLSEC, or as some other people say, MLSECOPS. And this is the challenge, actually. All right, so we need to understand how we're going to build security into every stage of uh, this uh, set of processes that Francesco is alluding to. Uh, so we need to understand the full problem space that we are dealing with. So as usual, with new cool technologies, we have more complexity. We have more layers. So let's break things down uh, and try to understand um, uh, at a conceptual level what these layers are. Uh, so at the bottom, obviously, we need infrastructure. Um, we, I'm not, there's been tens, hundreds of talks at this conference on securing infrastructure, so we're not going to focus too much on this today. Um, we, of course, have an orchestration layer on top, um, and we actually need this to define, execute all of the operations on data and on the ML model itself. Data is at the heart of ML, obviously, uh, so the data layer is crucial. Uh, we need to think about collection, I.O. labeling, the data sets themselves. Um, securing the data layer is foundational and fundamental. Even more important is the model itself. Um, it's crucial here to secure the operations when training the model. And then finally, we're going to have apps leveraging our model, and we will have these as entry points, so we clearly need to define um, our security countermeasures for these apps as well. However, we're not going to focus much on the application side here. Application and infrastructure we will slightly descope and talk about tangentially. OK, so we won't go through this quite busy diagram um, end to end, uh, because we'll cover these things uh, a bit more slowly as we go through the next sections of the talk. Um, but this is a detailed view of the MLSEC problem space and the different stages. Um, the important thing is to know, um, you have this diagram here, you can download the slides. The important to know, thing to know is it's, it's complex, and let's start breaking this down into more digestible chunks. 
So overall, the main challenges when securing MLOps have to do with complexity, dependencies, and data flows. It's a multi-dimensional problem which en encompasses, among many other things, data security, model security, access control, and supply chain security. Okay, with that, enough of the theory, over to Francesco. Yes, so as we always, apologies. It's got falling every time. Uh, as we always advocate at Control Planer, when we face a large problem space, there is only one technique to navigate through that uh, uh, problem space, which is threat modeling. So let's jump into the interesting stuff. Right, and to do so, we'll do it through a uh, use case. So you guys can enjoy some pictures. Right, so to show the effective uh, threat modeling, um, we start from this use case. In this uh, um, picture, you can see a number of spacecrafts. They are very expensive uh, pieces of hardware, very large as well, um, flying up there in the sky. They, they send down a constant telemetry stream. Uh, telemetry comes with uh, thousands of parameters, sensor temperatures, uh, all sorts of stuff. These uh, telemetry streams, uh, they reach Earth, they are um, converted from RF into IP communication, and the data, they flow, uh, the, the data flows to centralized locations where it's collected then for analysis. Why this troublesome approach? Because telemetry is very important for one thing. It tells you when things break, right? So you have uh, um, people keeping an eye on systems uh, that can uh, tell you if something breaks up there. And then, based on what breaks, you can take uh, um, some, uh, some, some actions to make sure the, 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 yes, the, the whole thing doesn't explode. Right, so um, the initial approach was a very reactive approach to uh, anomaly prediction. So based on the historical data, based on what we know, and based on a very long list of if-then-else uh, statements, um, they tried to, again, understand what something was, was going to break and then take appropriate actions, a very reactive and ad hoc approach. Company X, which is uh, the, the, the guys behind this whole thing, said, can we do something better? And the answer was, yes, of course. And they kicked off the, a project. The project consisted into moving from a reactive approach to a more proactive approach. So we have all these petabytes of data. Can we make a better use of these petabytes of data? And uh, this is the stack they came up with, an infra layer doesn't really matter um, at this stage, a proper operating system. And then on top, there was a you know, modern organization chose a, a workload orchestration that you can guess, uh, being at KubeCon. Um, and then on top, they built the MLOps uh, layer on Kubeflow, extended with TensorFlow. And then on top, they built uh, apps to do what? Again, to predict uh, when something could go wrong uh, based on the data and based on the current situation. Right, uh, of course, Company X uh, is very, very security cautious, and reason being, uh, they have very, very sensitive customers, and they have to be able to demonstrate uh, quantitative security in a way. So Company X uh, chose to run a threat model of this entire uh, infrastructure and the way they were doing MLOps on the infrastructure as well. Uh, the assumptions for the threat model, we are dealing with a sophisticated threat actor with significant capabilities, so not the famous script KD with a hoodie. Um, no disrespect, I was one of them. So, um, And then uh, ML was used to inform only about what, could, what was going to go wrong, potentially, not really used to fix anything. Still humans were involved there. And then we uh, actually descoped, uh, descoped uh, over-the-air communications, the ground segment backbone, and the data center, the infrastructure, the operating system, layer and Kubernetes to a degree. Now, the next picture is going to be very uh, busy, but uh, we will walk you through it. This is the reference architecture of the um, system put together. Again, we are uh, at a fairly high level of abstraction. In threat modeling, we start at uh, level zero, and this is the data flow diagram. So here, what you can see is effectively the layers. The scope of the threat model was within uh, the red dotted line. And as you can see, there are humans accessing the infrastructure, data being moved around, um, and then we have different stages. So, okay, the MLOps layer is where you define pipelines, you design the way data will be analyzed and how. And then on the data model and lifecycle layer, you have three stages after the data ingest. You have the data preparation stage, that's when you clean data, normalize data, 
transform the data as needed, and then label the data for the training um, process itself. Train and tune, stage two, data loading, weighting, uh, assigning different weight to different uh, data within the, the, the data set, uh, tune hyperparameters for the, um, pro the training process itself, uh, the training process itself, and then evaluation of um, the process itself. <laughs> And then the third stage, deploy and monitor. Now you have a model, a trained model. You want to um, serialize it, aka convert it into files, so that then can run on a runtime. In this particular case, uh, being Kubernetes and being Kubeflow, everything you see here is actually containerized workloads. Spoiler alert. Then the model is tested, uh, is deployed into production, and then it serves uh, applications and downstream customers through a front end. Uh, and then this whole thing is monitored. Now, let's deep dive uh, um, into the first stage, data ingest and preparation. Now, we um, go low, one level down in abstraction. We are talking about level one in threat modeling. So data flow diagram is here, as you can see. You still have humans. Um, you have different uh, um, steps. You have uh, data storages. In this case, is an ingestion storage and a pipeline storage. And um, this is how it goes. So data sources can be anything. Data ingest is a process of uh, collecting this data and then storing it into an ingestion storage. This is outside of the pipeline. Then a um, work containerized workload, in this case the clean job, loads data from the ingestion storage, does what it's supposed to do, and then stores data in the pipeline storage. In these three initial steps, you can already see how many entities are involved and how much data is moving around. This is already determining our attack surface, by the way. Uh, then the normalize, again, load and storing of data in the pipeline storage, transform, same thing, and then label, same thing. We also have here trust boundaries. And when data uh, goes across trust boundaries is when we have to focus. Right, so in threat modeling, what can go wrong? Based on this, we start enumerating threats. Right? And again, well, and this is also one of the key takeaways for the talk. Uh, this is not about AI security necessarily. This is about uh, things that you need to do on everything. Because threat modeling applies to everything. And the threats are also non-AI specific, uh, like uh, data injection, like poisoning of data, like uh, compromising the data quality in the ingestion storage, right? Or a malicious actor can target the clean step, can compromise the clean step and job itself uh, and maybe they can clean up some critical data, critical for the um, training process. And we are talking about petabytes of data. So it's hard to find what the data, um, if they actually target specific data and what data they removed. The same thing that injection and poisoning of data can happen uh, at pipeline storage level. And then in the label um, task, uh, malicious actors could potentially tamper with the labeling process itself, so causing different data to be labeled wrongly. Threat modeling, what can go wrong? Next step is, what do we do? Based on the threats we enumerated, remember we are in the Kubernetes uh, and Kubeflow world, we can identify controls. Controls such as uh, digital signing of data, again, selectively, is petabytes, so we have to be careful what we want to, to, to actually sign. Uh, introducing RBAC on storage operations. Again, these are very common controls. The implementation may differ, but they are same good old controls. Network segmentation for storage. And then back to the uh, individual containerized workloads, um, verifying signatures of every image being loaded. Uh, digitally signed data, the data being uh, uh, then sent to the pipeline storage. Or RBAC on tools uh, and RBAC on the uh, infrastructure itself. And then eventually manual reviews. Uh, and for the pipeline storage, pretty much the same. Now the pipeline storage is actually within Cube, so you have uh, RBAC, um, you can introduce a stringent role-based access control on Kubernetes storage operations. You can introduce uh, secured manifests. You can as well uh, introduce admission control or OPA to prevent unauthorized volume mounts. Next stage, train and tune. This is slightly different in the sense that we have also a bunch of artifacts in version control repositories. And these are uh, things like uh, the training jobs, the way the training job is described, uh, or the tuning jobs. And these are files uh, manipulated by data scientists. So they, they, they stay on a version control 
system. Now, it's pretty much the same. Each uh, step runs as a containerized workload. <coughs> Excuse me. And each uh, containerized workload loads and stores data from and to the storage. Now, again, uh, waiting, uh, training, uh, hyperparameters tuning, uh, and evaluation. Threat modeling, what can go wrong? The threat actor could target uh, the version control system so they can effectively stealing keys or whatever. They can um, uh, manipulate the training jobs themselves. They can manipulate uh, the tuning jobs. They can, uh, compromise, um, they can compromise the model itself via tampering with the gradients. They can uh, cause a model degradation due to poison hyperparameters. I had to learn all that, by the way, when, you know, it's not something that, you, it's not straightforward. Um, they can uh, bypass uh, the pipeline, so they can inject uh, uh, specific workloads at runtime. They can, again, cause model degradation um, because of poison training data, or the usual threats to storage, as well as the model compromise via parameter uh, tampering. Threat modeling, next step, after we um, understand what can go wrong and we enumerate the threats, what do we do about it? Identify controls. And again, these are non-AI specific. It's about securing AI end-to-end, -end, but those are not AI specific. Uh, Multi-factor authentication on um, the version control systems, signed commits, two key principles for um, um, impactful changes to files, and then uh, signing of images, uh, verify image signatures, and then sign the outputs. And at storage level, as before, are back on um, storage operations, secure manifests, admission control uh, to prevent unauthorized volume mounts, and then access control on the parameter server, which is something that was quite interesting to do. Monsieur? OK, so now we have a trained model. Uh, let's start thinking about deploying and monitoring um, what's going on. Uh, so serialization is the first step cru that's crucial here, uh, where we convert a train model into files, uh, package them into a container uh, image, and then load whenever we need to run it. Um, so we have the serialization step. Um, we then uh, load the model. Um, we, well, we, we have an image registry where images are stored. Uh, we load the model uh, for testing and deployment. We then serve this to be consumed uh, by um, uh, front ends. Uh, so we're not going to see much new here. We're going to take the same approach that Francesco has been taking throughout the um, first uh, parts of this threat modeling exercise. Uh, we're going to ask what can go wrong, um, and we'll, we'll see some common uh, themes here. So we could have something going wrong in the serialization step, where we actually um, uh, tamper with the, uh, with, with the model itself. Uh, we could tamper directly in the image registry. Um, now, tampering is one thing, but um, we could also load this. Um, those are two separate things, right? We could um, store a malicious image, and then loading it is a separate attack vector. Uh, we have to think about protecting against both of them. Um, in terms of test data, attackers can tamper with test data in order to try and cover their tracks. Um, and when things are being served, we can try and feed uh, malicious input to the model. Um, when it comes to front end, we have our usual OWASP type um, top 10 type threats, which are always uh, ever present. Um, so. Again, nothing groundbreaking here. Um, and moving on to the next step of what, uh, what we can do about these things that can go wrong, we will again not see anything groundbreaking. We're going to talk about signing artifacts a lot. Um, now, signing an artifact um, doesn't mean that we're perfectly secure. All it means is that an entity with an identity that is trusted um, liked this artifact at some point in time with some definition of liking that artifact. Um, so throughout the talk, you're seeing we're taking this uh, zero trust approach. We're shrinking trust boundaries down. Uh, we're trying to define explicit trust relationships. Um, I always think zero trust is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it really means don't implicitly trust things. It does mean explicitly trust things and make informed authorization decisions based on those explicit trust relationships. So signing data is, of course, going to be key. Um, but signing alone is not enough. We have to enforce, um, we've done uh, one step here, we've got some signed data. We need to enforce that that signed data, um, uh, 
that it's actually that thing that's run. So here um, we will have a mission control at a deployment time, for example. Um, again, we're not seeing any groundbreaking new controls here. All we're doing is mapping uh, threats to controls uh, for compliance purposes. On the front end side, we have the usual input validation, etc. We have request throttling, um, and when it comes to test data, we want to also sign this uh, so that we can ensure that uh, an attacker cannot tamper with this. All right, so everything we've looked at so far has been quite generic and applicable across um, many different implementations. Um, Kubeflow itself um, warrants a threat model, um, and we need to do this. Um, we need to scope this, and here is a, um, just a spider diagram of kind of some concepts within Kubeflow. We won't go into this in great detail because I know we're a bit short on time. Um, it's important to note that we are actually um, threat modeling. I say we, um, Andy Martin and friends in tag security, Kubeflow, Kubeflow is currently on the agenda for a threat model. Uh, so please, we welcome contributions. Um, you can have a look at this uh, GitHub issue here and, and track how things are going. There is a, a Google Doc which um, is publicly available. You'll be able to, to see it and see what's going on. Uh, so that is actively in progress at the moment. And please, if you're interested, come and talk to us at the end and we'll um, tell you how you can get involved. All right, uh, so uh, again, being a bit short on time, um, here is an example data flow diagram at level zero for um, Kubeflow. Uh, we're not going to go this in um, massive detail, but um, basically pipeline components are containerized, um, uh, self-contained sets of code that perform one step in your ML workflow, such as pre-processing data or training a model. To create a component, you must build the components implementation and define the component specification. Your components implementation includes the components executable code and the container image um, uh, that this will be contained within. Interact interactive environments for writing and running the code, documenting work, creating visualizations in a narrative format. These are also things that we need to take into account. Um, widely used for data analysis, model development, and research. Uh, so again, um, please have a look into Kubeflow and, uh, and join us in threat modeling this. And with that, back to Fran. All right, thanks, James. As we head to the end, um, those are um, fairly generic threats. Those are generic controls that everyone can actually understand. There are instead AI-specific threats, and we are um, bootstrapping a piece of work with King's College to actually do some um, red teaming for AI. Anyway, this is a breakdown of the categories of uh, more AI-specific threats. Uh, we have uh, model and system threats. I'll just pick one, like model inversion. So it's about techniques uh, to extract the data the uh, model was trained on, just having the opportunity to deal with, a, uh, with the model itself. Uh, output manipulation threats, like uh, executa executable code injection, which consists of manipulating model to output executable code for malicious purposes. Access and privacy, this is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, for example, data privacy violation, which is uh, inappropriate use or storage of personal or sensitive data with all the GDPR implications um, in this case. Compliance and governance, um, random and unusual attack like model, model subversion or injecting a bias or other undesired traits into the model undetectably. This pretty advanced. Uh, people and organization, governance, lapses, uh, inadequate oversight and procedures uh, for maintaining security, back to the um, more general threats, and then monitoring and response. Uh, inadequate anomaly detection, failing to detect abnormal mode of behavior or security incidents in real time. We are still struggling to understand how to detect and react to threats in cloud native, let alone in the AI space. Uh, key takeaways. When you build something, threat model everything. Adapting and integrating different, to different teams. Again, threat modeling as DevOps is a practice to bring everyone at the same table, the experts, data scientists, uh, ML engineers, uh, and the security folks. Common threats, this is a key takeaway. Common threats still apply to AI ML based applications. And AI-specific threats, on the other hand, can be quite complex. Uh, and as usual, collaborative approach is required. Uh, join and contribute uh, to tag security, if you can, into threat modeling Kubeflow. And uh, word of advice, uh, keep up with the regulatory landscape. 
because that's ever evolving and it's not going to go away anytime soon. That said, if you wish, we have a free half book here, Hacking Kubernetes from our CEO Andy Martin. You can download it from, uh, from, uh, by scanning the QR code. And thank you very much. We don't have time for questions, but we are going to stay there for, the, for, for some time now if you want to come and ask anything at all. Thank you again.